So we'll start in the second um, part of the morning with the um, first of the two topics on opiate alternatives. Um, so let's not forget about the emotional component of pain. Um, I will talk um, about the behavioral integrity aspect of it. Our first speaker is um, Dr. Beth Darnell. She's a clinical associate professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, um, Division of Pain Medicine. Um, Stanford System Neuroscience and Pain Laboratory. Um, she is, has been extremely involved in the acute pain um, and the special interest group being a chair in 2013. Um, she has a, um, a significant interest in the PARC program and she'll talk to us about um, the important intervention done before surgery with uh, potential long term and great um, impact on pain and impact. much. First of all, I want to thank um, Dan and Bob and also Adriana for the kind invitation for, and for all of you for, um, for listening to something completely different now. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about is ultimately my surgical success, which is an internet-based perioperative pain psychology <coughs> intervention. So these are my disclosures, um, my NIH funding. Um, I also like to put my two books up here. So in full disclosure, my bias even though the titles of my book um, are around minimizing opioids, opioids are not bad. I'm really grateful they're there. They have their place. They do work for some people with chronic pain. And I also am dedicated to helping people acquire skills that enhances and facilitates endogenous pain modulatory control as a pathway to opioid sparing. But regardless of whether people are taking opioids or not, it's important that they optimize their own skills and capacity to regulate. Okay, so chronic post-surgical pain and opioid use um, worldwide, um, 230 million surgeries performed is probably an underestimate. Um, on average, 10% of individuals will go on to develop ongoing pain, and it really varies by the surgery. So for instance, with Total knee arthroplasty will see as many as 30% of individuals go on to have chronic pain. And then the question is why? What are those factors that predict whether or not someone goes on to have prolonged pain and also need in use of opioids? So there's a big emphasis now on minimizing use of opioids and helping people get off opioids more quickly after surgery. And then additionally, there's a focus on helping people return to function. And so in this realm of perioperative space, we talk about it as prehabilitation, there's been a focus, uh, more of a focus, on doing this from the physical perspective. So helping people um, acquire certain um, physical therapies prior to surgery as a pathway to reduce postoperative pain and also functional restoration. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is this concept that we can also do this from a psychological perspective. And this has been um, underappreciated that there is some research in this space. <coughs> so what we know is that two individuals could go into surgery and they could have similar characteristics, similar um, reasons for surgery, but these two people will have completely different outcomes, potentially. So there's a lot of individual variation. And so it's not unlike the outpatient setting, where we see individuals with chronic pain. You know, they may have the same pain condition and even the same pain intensity, but they have completely different experiences. And so it's sort of the wisdom of what we see in the outpatient setting is also true um, for the surgical setting. So the question is, what accounts for the majority of these individual differences? And what the data tell us is that what we would suspect as being the big players in terms of outcomes aren't necessarily the biggest players after all. So we might think about, well, it's the surgery type or the injury severity or even the surgeon is playing the biggest role in how quickly a patient recovers after surgery, how well they do. And in fact, those are not the biggest predictors. It turns out that psychological factors are driving a lot of the outcomes. They're some of the most important predictors for how well someone does after surgery, how quickly they achieve pain cessation, 
and also opioid cessation. And so one of the aspects of a person's psychology that turns out to be enormously predictive in their post-surgical outcomes turns out to be pain catastrophizing. And pain catastrophizing is a psychological construct. It, um, this is the pain catastrophizing scale right here. There are 13 items, which you can see, and there are three subscales. So there's magnification, rumination, and helplessness. And this is the pain catastrophizing scale is the most widely used measure to quantify level of catastrophizing. And so as you can see, it's just a person's cognitive and emotional orientation to the context of pain. So the instructions for the pain catastrophizing scale actually ask the individual, when you experience, when you have a painful experience, maybe it's a dental procedure or an injury, how do you tend to think and feel in the context of pain? And so the pain catastrophizing scale doesn't assume that a person has pain at that moment. In fact, any of us in this room can take the pain catastrophizing scale right now um, assuming you're even pain-free right now, and it will be very, very uh, much predictive of how well you do over time, such that it will predict whether or not we go on in the course of the next year to acquire low back pain. And so these are population-level studies that really stand in a testament to how uh, the power, the predictive power of the pain catastrophizing scale. So I just wanted to give you that um, the actual items there so that you can look at them and, and be thinking about them as we go forward. So it turns out that um, in, the, in the context of surgery, similar to the outpatient setting, that it is driving a lot of the outcomes, post-surgical outcomes. So just to give you a few examples of what the data tell us, um, we administer the pain catastrophizing scale before surgery. Now, in the case of somebody who's probably receiving total knee arthroplasty, they probably do have existing pain before surgery. That's something to keep in mind. Um, but we administer this measure before surgery, pain catastrophizing scale, and what we find is that six months after the surgery, a person's pre-surgical pain catastrophizing score is highly predictive of how well they're doing afterwards, whether or not they have pain and whether they're, or not they're on opioids. And remembering that about 30% of this population will have ongoing pain um, after surgery. And so in this case, it's very, this uh, particular study is showing that it's very predictive of functional outcome after uh, knee arthroplasty. This is uh, just another study. This is a meta-analysis, systematic review. Um, similarly, looking at pre-surgical catastrophizing and its ability to predict acquisition of chronic post-surgical pain. And across 15 different studies, more than 5,000 patients, um, the authors of this meta-analysis concluded that pain catastrophizing was the strongest predictor for chronic post-surgical pain. These studies tend to control for pain intensity and also depression, other factors where you might be thinking, you know, well, what else is going on there? They tend to, um, they tend to conduct those multivariate analyses. So across the board, the data tell us that pre-surgical uh, pain catastrophizing is associated with greater post-surgical opioid use. This is this particular study here. The top one is conducted um, in inpatient in the hospital also post-surgical pain across multiple studies. It's also predictive of length of stay after surgery, delayed early uh, recovery from surgery, and also the function, as I already alluded to. And so lastly, I just wanted to briefly touch on this particular study because it specifically looked at risk factors for continued opioid use one and two months after surgery for musculoskeletal trauma. And so they measured catastrophizing in, in these psychosocial factors and clinical factors prior to surgery, also at one month and two months after surgery. And then what they found, unsurprisingly, is that most of the psychological factors were predictive of prolonged opioid use, but the single best factor um, to account for prolonged opioid use was pain catastrophizing. So you may wonder, 
what's the magic number with catastrophizing? Where do, where's that inflection point for where the risk lies? And when we're looking at the outpatient studies, outpatient samples, we see um, historically the data told us that it was uh, at the upper end of the, the 20s up towards 30 where you would see that pain catastrophizing was associated with long-term disability, uh, likelihood to return to work, et cetera. So the pain catastrophizing scale, <coughs> those 13 items, the scale, the actual response scale is zero to four. So the total score is zero to, uh, it's on a range from zero to 52. And so right around 27 to 30 is where they would say, okay, in the outpatient setting, you're kind of in that clinical range. We want to really be focusing on treatment for you. But in fact, for the surgical studies, what we see is that catastrophizing at much lower levels is predictive of poor outcomes. So those earlier studies that I put up there looking at um, delayed recovery after surgery um, and prolonged pain after surgery, what those studies are telling us is that right around 15 on the pain catastrophizing scale is really that inflection point where, so the, the take home message is, is that catastrophizing exerts, appears to exert a more powerful influence at lower levels when it comes to surgery. And that's something to keep in mind because if we're just thinking about it from that outpatient setting, we're missing a lot of the story and many people may go untreated who really um, are in need of treatment. And I just wanna say, I'm not presenting these data today, but some of our newer research coming out of our lab, I, I don't know if that will be presented later um, in the day, but similarly showing uh, that at lower levels of catastrophizing, we see risk for um, likelihood for opioid prescription in outpatients with chronic pain. Okay, so this pain catastrophizing scale, these, um, you know, these 13 items, uh, this psychological construct has such a powerful influence in the outpatient setting and also in, in the surgical setting. And there's really interesting research coming out of, um, with David Seminowitz, and, and he's uh, a neuroimaging researcher. And what his work has shown is that people who catastrophize, this is done in outpatients with chronic pain, people who catastrophize, he's correlated that with volumetric deficits and areas of the brain that are associated with pain control. And when you take these patients and you put them through eight to 11 weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, this pain CBT, those classes that we send everyone to and they go every week for eight weeks, sometimes 11 weeks. When they finish a course of CBT, they do pre-post neuroimaging and then they are able to show volumetric increases in the regions of the brain associated with pain control. And that effect is mediated by reductions in pain catastrophizing. So the way that we define pain, this is a striking version of the definition, but not just a sensory experience, but also a noxious emotional experience. And it appears that this component here, this um, both the evaluative and the emotional component of pain has a tremendous impact. I like to tell my patients that Pain is your harm alarm, and it's designed to get your attention and to motivate you to get away from whatever is uh, a threat. But that evaluation of threat is um, much more pronounced in certain individuals, and that's all that we're talking about. Catastrophizing is just a, a, this um, heightened evaluative evaluation of threat, and it turns out that it works against our patients, both in the outpatient and also in the surgical setting such that um, a person could just have the experience of pain, but when pain is catastrophized, when there is an evaluation of heightened threat, that it leads to an amplification in the nervous system that not only is distressing, but it actually shapes the nervous system itself. So we see that it changes the function of the brain, that it attunes the brain to pain, actually lights up regions of the brain associated with pain, so there's amplified pain processing. We also see that it changes the neural functioning in these patients such that their neural patterns are different at rest, even when they're not under a pain challenge of any kind. And we see that this essentially shapes the nervous system, priming it for more pain and poor surgical outcome over time. So 
what are we going to do about this? Well, as it turns out, um, there are some treatments that we can connect patients to that enhance regulation, that help people learn how to quiet this harm alarm themselves so that they have better control, so that they're not unwittingly amplifying pain processing in their nervous system. And one of these happens to be meditation. And this was a really elegant study um, conducted by Fadal and Zaiden and, and colleagues where they took patients and basically gave them a very brief training um, in meditation. It turned out to be 80 minutes total. So just within 80 minutes, um, they gave them this training. And what they were able to show is that following a very brief training, that afterwards when, they, when participants were put through a pain challenge, a pain task, that they had much better regulation. They had less pain intensity, less pain bothersomeness. And this, for me, was very interesting as a psychologist because we were used to thinking about these eight weeks and months of training. And what the field was showing us is that perhaps these briefer treatments could confer um, a very nice effect. And, and therefore, they would be much more efficient and accessible and lower cost. So using this as a model, and then in the outpatient setting, I'm a pain psychologist um, working with people with chronic pain. I um, used that, that prior work to, as an inspiration to develop a brief treatment, a brief class. This is a single session class. It's roughly two hours long. And people come to the class for just once, and what I teach them in this very compressed pain psychology is cognitive behavioral therapy for how to identify catastrophizing uh, and how to stop catastrophizing using these basic cognitive behavioral therapy skills, which we know work well. It's been demonstrated over these multiple sessions. My challenge was to kind of take um, the most salient kernels from each of those modules and compress it into a format that um, would be most accessible to people. So I really use catastrophizing as the example for how best to control distress that comes up around pain and in other areas of a person's life. So this was a two hour class I developed. We pilot tested it in mixed etiology samples of people with chronic pain at Stanford. And, um, and, and we had some lovely results from that, showing that um, we had you know, roughly a 50% reduction in catastrophizing um, after people took the class. So they, we measure their catastrophizing before the class, they take the class, and then we just follow them to see how they do. And this was one month later. We found this nice effect. We found moderately to substantial important uh, reductions in pain catastrophizing and nice effect sizes at the one month mark, large uh, effect uh, for the class Cohen's D greater than one. And so um, this was very encouraging to us because what we were showing for the first time is that you, you can compress this information and uh, deliver it in a single session and have some clinically meaningful impacts. And we used this uh, to apply for major NIH funding. And uh, this is a, the R01 uh, that myself and Dr. Mackey have from NCCIH. And so we're studying the, eff the comparative efficacy of this class to the eight week cognitive behavioral therapy as well as to a health education control. So this is um, what's, what we're doing right now at Stanford. And then I started thinking about next steps. And so um, given that we have this established intervention that we're studying, every year in the pre-op clinic at Stanford, there are 20,000 patients are seen. And so this seems like a really nice opportunity to have a positive impact on people who are going into surgery and are at risk for having poor surgical outcomes because their psychology is not yet optimized. Um, so I did some research to see what was known in the space of perioperative psychological interventions. And you know, the bottom line I can tell you is that it's really in its infancy. There's, there is uh, not a lot out there that's quite impressive at this stage. 
Um, but there is this one study that I found that was really interesting, and this is was uh, led by Dan Riddle, who also conducted some of that earlier work showing that people with a lower PCS, right around 16, are at risk for poor outcomes after surgery. And he, what he and his group here, Frank Keith, Mark Jensen, they um, put together a coping skills training for people that they identify before surgery who have a high PCS score. And what they did in this study, this is a quasi-experimental study, and they had 18 people in the treatment group. And what the treatment group consisted of is one in-person visit and three telephone visits with a psychologist. So they got like four hours with you know personal one-on-one -on -one um, time with a psychologist and then after surgery they got another three phone visits plus a one-on-one -on -one. so altogether they got at least eight hours of personalized intervention and then compared them to just the usual care cohort and what they found was substantial reductions in pain catastrophizing reductions in pain post-surgically compared to usual care and also improvements in functioning so everything's going in the expected direction it's all great news um, the, the only thing about this to bear in mind is that it does require a lot of human resources to make the calls, to do the in-person visits. And so what we, what we know we need at this stage is really scalable solutions to meet the needs of these you know, millions of patients. Um, because uh, this was a study I uh, helped to lead earlier this year showing that there are not that many skilled uh, psychologists um, it, when it comes to pain and treating pain that there are many psychologists you know throughout communities and uh, around the world but but what we quantified was an actual dearth in comfort and competency in treating pain and all of these emotional aspects that are relevant to pain so pain is largely going untreated uh, in the therapeutic context, and that's not going to help all of these patients who are going in for surgery. So again, the need for these scalable solutions. So essentially what I did was take that outpatient class, the catastrophizing class, adapt it for patients who are about to go undergo surgery. This is called My Surgical Success. It is fully automated. It's all delivered over the internet. So patients go to this website, and step one, they download a personalized plan. Step two, they watch a 90-minute video and they complete their plan while they're watching the video. Step three, they download an audio, a relaxation response audio. And those are really the key three steps. We also ask for the feedback. But what's nice about this is that it basically requires no human power whatsoever. We can just randomize people to this uh, fully automated, internet-based, perioperative pain psychology treatment. And so this is a randomized controlled trial that we are conducting right now. Um, this, is, this study is being conducted in women who are scheduled for surgery for breast cancer. And the breast uh, surgeon refers the patients to our research team. Um, so that's up at the top, these yellow blocks. We receive the names of these women, we screen them, and enroll them into the study. And we, we sort of take all comers. The only requirement is that they have to be a certain number of days prior to surgery so that they can actually get the intervention. That's the main thing. Um, so they, we screen and enroll them, we randomize them, either to health education control, which is also delivered online. These are just basic. It's information about nutrition and, and sleep and basic health information. They're, they're told this can be helpful for healing after surgery. That's the health education control. Or they go to My Surgical Success where they really learn about the importance of their thoughts, their emotions, how to calm any distress that comes up, and they complete that personalized plan. After they receive the treatment, they go down and right before their surgery date, we collect their pain catastrophizing score again. Uh, because we want to understand, okay, they got this treatment, did their catastrophizing score change or not? They go through surgery and then post-surgically, we track them daily for pain ratings and also for opioid use. So what we're looking for, so daily for 30 days, and then we also track them twice weekly for two weeks, 
and then once weekly for another two weeks. And what we're collecting data for is to be able to uh, model time to opioid cessation, time to pain cessation. And then at these follow-up time points, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks, we're administering a full battery of psychosocial um, measures, certainly catastrophizing, but also the, the usual correlates that you would expect, anxiety, depression, sleep, pain interference, etc. cetera. Um, and so we're really looking to see whether this reduction in catastrophizing can truly lead to meaningful differences, improvements in uh, pain, also opioid cessation, so opio as an opioid sparing technique. But most importantly, we just want to help people get back to doing the things they love and, and doing that sooner because this uh, catastrophizing, as I've shown from some of those earlier studies, is linked to that delayed recovery and prolongation of pain and also opioid use. So we're, what we're hoping to do is be able to uh, identify so, uh, an effect here that would then support the value of this intervention going forward. It would be especially nice um, because this, again, is essentially free. It's all delivered on the internet. So here's where we are. This is our consort diagram so far. Um, I'm just going to kind of focus on the main, um, the core here. We've screened 239 individuals and enrolled um, just over 100, um, and they, most of those have been uh, randomized. We have in the My Surgical Success Group 39 active study participants, and in the Health Education Control, 28 active. We're, our target is 40 in each group. We're literally um, looking to close the study within the next two months. So uh, by the end of the year, we should have some preliminary results. Um, we have seen some higher attrition in the My Surgical Success group, which you can see the attrition of um, 26. And most of those, most people in, in that category drop out before um, treatment. And so these are people who have a lot going on before surgery. Um, they have cancer, they're scheduled for surgery, they're, you know, they're, uh, a lot of people may sign up and then feel like, you know, I just don't have time to do the hour and a half. Uh, we've actually heard from a few people, you know, I'm so stressed I can't do one more thing. And it's sort of the irony because it's an intervention that in part helps people manage stress better. So I always know that those are the people who need it the most, but um, unfortunately, that's sort of the, the nature of the beast. Um, so there are gonna be definitely gonna be a subset of patients who are really unwilling to engage in something like this. And we know that going forward. Um, but for those who do, hopefully we find a nice effect there. And then what we're doing it, as a next step, um, Dr. Mackey's gonna tell you later this afternoon about pre-op choir learning uh, health system that exists in the Stanford pre-op clinic. And it allows us to um, basically identify who could, who, who needs an intervention such as this and for it to be automatically delivered. And so that's our next step in this equation. And we are developing uh, a three item daily pain catastrophizing scale that will allow us to uh, identify sort of mechanisms of effect once this is in place. Am I at time? I'm sort of mindful of I, I have a clock here, but it's actually not counting down, so I don't know where I am. Um, but I, that's essentially what I had to present. And as I said, Dr. Mackey will say more about Periop Choir as the platform to de deliver an intervention, an automated delivery of interventions such as this and others. Um, and I hope in the coming months to be able to share with you the results of that RCT that we are getting close to wrapping up. And um, with that, thank you.